very strong and help you, so it help you avoid injuries and help you if uh, uh, if you find certain equipment aboard your boat uh, too heavy for you to operate. So first of all, ah, I see Pam's hands. <laughs> you can see I'm big and I'm strong. I'm like <laughs> an Amazon, right? If I say get it, you say got it. Get it. Got Good. It. Okay. So I use a double grip winch handle. I mean, why not? It, it, I, there's no way in the world that I can get our Genoa in with one hand. So I have a double grip winch handle. There's no way in the world that I can get the lock tension on the mainsail without a double grip winch handle. There's no way in the world that I can help Andy get the dinghy deployed by using the spinnaker halyard, because I'm the one on the winch. I use a double grip winch handle. It is so simple, it is so easy, it's there. That's what I use all the time. I never use a single grip winch handle because I don't have the strength in one arm to do what has to be done. Next tip is uh, having a way to raise your outboard and get it uh, out of the water. We have here, this is actually uh, the arch on the back of our boat, and here we just have a little uh, davit uh, with, uh, this doesn't have a four-part tackle, but it'd be better to have a four-part tackle to give you a lot of, uh, uh, of leverage. And uh, then we basically attach that to a harness on the top of the outboard, raise it up, bring it alongside and drop it down on the motor mount there. The last thing, you, you want to have a way to very easily raise your outboard. It's one thing, you may think, okay, yeah, I can raise it, I can manhandle it. Well, sometimes it's going to be really, really bumpy in the anchorage, and a lot of backs get hurt because people end up twisting with a dancing, uh, dancing outboard in rough conditions. So, so having something very simple like this made uh, or, uh, to, to bring your outboard up uh, can definitely help your back. Kathy and I both made our own, but I just came, I just passed the Edson booth as I was coming up here, and Edson has made a fabulous one that isn't that expensive. Uh, of course, you have to have some kind of a pole aft, I, and I wrote, I call it the mizzen. It's a pole that holds this for the outboard motor. It's a pole that holds our solar panels, you'll see it. But go check out the, the Edson uh, booth to see what they have for their dinghy, uh, their outboard motor lift. It's really cool. I looked at all of it, and they had all the good ideas that we try to incorporate in ours, and now it's made already. You don't have to make it yourself. Okay. What was the name of that provider? Edson. E-D-S-O-N. It's a steering company. But they have, oh my gosh, all their equipment is like jewelry. <laughs> <laughs> I mean beautifully made. That's what I mean. Ah, here's another uh, example of a, uh, uh, and this is a basically using your windlass to uh, raise the person up the mast. Sometimes it's very hard to do with the, the, with, uh, the winch that you have on the mast, using a halyard to raise the person. So here the line is being led up to the electric windlass to raise the person to the top of the mast. The only thing you have to be really cautious of is when you ease the person back down again. You know, you have to be sure that you are totally in control of that winch that is bringing someone down. And don't just flip it off. Get it? <laughs> Good. Uh, oh, this is, this, is cool. okay. this is something that we designed when we, uh, uh, we, well, we started using it when we didn't have a water maker, but we still use it, uh, even though we do have a water maker sometimes, to haul water from shore. Uh, it's another instance where it's one thing to raise a jerry jug with water onto your deck when it's totally calm. It's another thing to raise jerry jug after jerry jug when you've got a whole bunch of bound, you know, when you've got a windy, uh, choppy anchorage. Uh, again, that jerking motion is very, very hard on backs. So this is uh, how we uh, worked out an arrangement. This is one of those, uh, I'll show you the next picture, you can kind of see more. It's one of those Plastimo um, flexible tanks that you, you can find at West Marine or any of the marine uh, stores. And uh, uh, ours is a 30-pound one. It's actually one of those triangular ones. And what we've done is we've rigged it here with a quick connect fitting. Uh, and what we do is we put this in the dinghy and we go ashore and uh, we basically uh, attach the hose from the, from the uh, water and just fill the tank, fill up, and put 30 gallons directly in this without ever lifting, uh, without ever lifting the tank up. Uh, then we come back to the boat and we come alongside right next to where our water fill is on the deck. And we just tie up along there and there we have some other things rigged. What we have rigged is, well, it's a, in our case, it's a Parmax 4 pump. This is a pump that we use for several other things on the boat and so it serves as a spare for our other pumps. But we also use it 
here rigged up with a little 12 volt uh, cigarette lighter so that we can plug it in on deck and then we have rigged it a hose that connects up to the, uh, to the quick connect fittings and with the dinghy tied up alongside and that 30 gallons directly uh, sitting in the dinghy, we just pump it directly into the tank. Uh, if we're concerned about the quality of the water, then we put, uh, a, well, we put uh, uh, a filter in line so that we filter the water before we bring it in. So at this point, without ever having to lift any water, we've managed to get 30 gallons of water in our tank. Whenever we get this out and do this, we end up lending it to other people in the anchorage so that everybody can basically fill up their tanks at the same time. So it's a, a really, uh, really handy little, little thing that's worked. And it gives us a spare, so because we, we always use the same pump we use for other purposes. Let, so. me just, let me just say something. We don't have something as cool as that. And we use jerry cans, you know, the six gallon jerry cans to, 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 to transport water from shore to the boat. But we never lift them from the dinghy up to the deck. Even though Andy's a great, big, strong guy, we always use a halyard to pull them up because water is extremely heavy and anybody's back could go out. Uh, don't ever try to lift a, a full jerry can from the bottom of a dinghy up to the deck of your boat. It's just, it's, it's guaranteed disaster, is it? Good. <laughs> okay, now we're going to talk about some things related to deck organization. Let's see what we have first. By the way, is everybody hearing us now? Okay, good. Uh, first thing, well, first thing we already mentioned was storing the whisker pole on the mast. Uh, anyway, it, uh, this is actually on my Whitby 42. We actually had two whisker poles so that we could go wing on wing with two poles stowed on the mast permanently ready to go. Um, mast rails. Um, mast rails are these things that allow you to basically work at the mast, that these rails allow you to work at the mast comfortably, with something to lean up against, something to make you feel, sort of feel secure, um, and they are a wonderful thing to have aboard your boat. Um, uh, and we have some suggestions about them. I actually, a uh, couple things. First of all, they need to be sized high enough that they provide support. You don't want them so low that you could risk going over backwards. Um, and, um, uh, and you want them strong enough so that they're not going to bend. A three-point system is best. Uh, and um, uh, here actually is showing one. This is actually uh, Pam's husband, Andy. Uh, and you can see these particular ones are too low. He can fall over backwards from them. Uh, here you've got three points, so they're good and steady. However, they're so low that he can fall over backwards. Here they are higher and, uh, and provide a more secure place for stowing it. Once you have them, they're absolutely wonderful to have aboard your boat. Uh, and here you see they have them straddling their dorade uh, around it. Uh, this is a terrible picture because uh, it's rigged, uh, you know, uh, when we're in a marina and actually happen to have a, an air conditioner sitting out there. But this is the one I have on my Whitby 42. And here we had them custom made. And this is, you can't see it, but it's a little bit slightly rounded. So it actually does kind of uh, provide a whole lot of support. I'm really pretty snug when I'm leaning up against it. This is rounded here. And then halfway up, I have this uh, little rail here that we use it for storing lines and halyards on as well. In addition, on our boat, it was really hard to get the um, halyard off the mast, and I could actually get inside of this thing, stand up on that rail, lean up against it, and I could use it to climb up high. So this provided a nice place for stowing lines, for tying off lines, uh, as well as allow me to stand up higher if I wanted to get up a little bit higher there. So, so there's another set of mast rails. Um, oh, and we would sometimes stow, you know, lines on them, fenders on them, etc. So they, they became a handy place on deck. Anything yeah. you want to say about them particular? No, no, that's it. Okay. Your jib sheets or anything doesn't tangle up with them at all? Mm -mm. Mm -mm. No. No. Mm -mm. no. 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 By the way, uh, being a rigger's wife, um, the most dangerous thing that my husband saw in the new vessels that were being built and everything was having all the halyards and all of it being going back to the cockpit. And the reason that is dangerous even though it keeps you in the cockpit, is you're not looking up because you've got usually a bimini top or a dodger and you can't look up. And I would say 70% of his work came from somebody who just kept pulling on either a reefing line or a halyard or something like that from the cockpit because that's where it was led to and not looking up to see that it was fouled before they started to pull it up. 
So if you have all your leafy lines and all your halyards going back to the cockpit, like many people do today, be sure to always be wary of, before you pull on anything, to watch and look and make sure it isn't fouled on something around your spreader or something like that. Our boat has everything at the mast because we have those mast tubes and because there's not a time that we use a halyard or a topping lift or reefing lines without looking up and making sure everything is secure the way it should be so that we don't create any more problems. Okay. Mass steps. Uh, so mass steps uh, are one way to get, uh, to, to get up to the mass to be able to work on it, either to the, up to the spreaders to be able to, to see more clearly or more, more likely to replace a light, uh, uh, to do any kind of work you have to do up the mass. Uh, Pam, since these are your mass steps, you want to talk about what creates a good mass step? Uh, what, what creates a good mass step? Of course, I, 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 don't, I really don't like the folding ones because it gives you something else you'd have to do at sea if you'd have to go up the mast at sea. You have to take the step out, and then you don't have anything to hang on to once you put your foot in there. And then when you're going down, you have to put the mast back again. So we, don't, we won't have folding ones. We have ones like this triangular shaped ones where you have a, a place where your foot will go in and not slip off, as you can see, and you can also hang on to it. And by the way, never let anyone talk you into the easy way of riveting mast steps onto your mast. They should always be tapped, you know, drilled and tapped and screwed in with, with machine screws. And don't forget Tef gel. Tef gel, don't ever leave home without it, Tef gel always has to go on any kind of a fastener that is not aluminum going into your aluminum mass. So if it's a stainless steel fastener that you're using machine screw to put those in, always put a dab of tough gel because any dissimilar metals will start to work on each other and create a battery. Where do you get that again? Pardon me? Where do you get tough gel at? <laughs> West Marine. <laughs> Probably any, any uh, uh, good marine store. But also another trick because of Andy many, many times putting these on, on people's boats, um, it's 15 inches. You know, I've seen them when they're five inches apart, you know, and I've seen them where they're three feet apart. And you know, it's so ridiculous. If you knew the formula, it's 15 inches. You know, you stagger them every 15 inches. 15 inches was from the top of one to 15 inches on the other side, okay? And that is a very good uh, staggering for anyone, someone who's small like me or someone who's tall like Andy was. Also, don't forget to put two at the top of the mast. Because otherwise, if you have to do a, a light bulb change or put a new coax down your mast for a VHF or you get hit by lightning and you have to check everything up there, you don't want to have to work like a stork at the top of your mast. <laughs> and be sure that the last two that are up there are high enough so that you're looking down the top of the mast. This one is just barely OK, but it's OK. But if you have them down too low, then you have to do all your work kind of like this, whereas what you really want is to have them up high enough so that you can look down and feed a new coax if you have to uh, down your mast. There's actually a couple other nice little tips up here. And one is, is that my brother here is wearing one of those marriage saver headsets, one of those little headsets that you can use to communicate with the helm. And he's using that to communicate with Margaret to say, you know, okay, turn, turn this switch off, turn that switch off on, you know, do this, do that, bring me this, and so it allows him them to communicate back and forth. In addition, notice he has a camera along, and he takes a picture of things at the top of the mast, uh, so uh, he knows exactly what kind of, what the state of the state of fittings are, exactly how things are attached, so he was actually, oh, we all, of course, we always love to take pictures looking down on our boat from there, but uh, he, I know he is also using it just to take a picture of exactly how things are connected up there, so he knows exactly what kind of screws and fittings he's working with for when he has to go back and do the next step of whatever he's installing there. So, And notice he has those two little handrails that actually give him even, even a little more stability up there working at the top of the mast. Also notice in this picture, what has he got besides climbing up the mast? He's got his bosun's chair on, okay? So anyone would be a fool to just climb up the mast without having someone tailing you with the bosun's chair. And of course, tying the bosun's chair off when you get up there. Safety, 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 safety. Even when Andy goes up on a bosun's chair, he doesn't trust the halyard while he's working up there because he can be up there for hours working up there in the business he was in, but he has a safety line that he takes and, and, and ties up to the top of the mast and doesn't rely on the halyard 
to keep him up there, nor on the mast steps if he's using mast steps. So this is a good picture. I like those handrails that are at the top of the mast too. That's really cool. Oh, there he is. <laughs> <laughs> That's a long way up. It's a tall mast. Uh, uh, okay. Um, also, here's so just some other methods for rat lines. Uh, rat lines aren't going to bring you to the top of the mast, but rat lines are lines that go between your uh, spreaders, uh, between your shrouds, and allow you to basically go up high enough to maybe help you navigate among coral, uh, you know, when you're navigating into a passage. So here is uh, Don up the, up the rat lines, uh, getting a better view of the, the, grout, the uh, water in front of him. Uh, also, Etienne is here, and Etienne has a product called a mast climber, which it provides another way to get up the mast. Yeah, also, rat lines are great, you know, if you're, um, if you've lost your floating moon channel on the side, or your floating expensive VHF radio, you have to make the call to go back and get it. Your child <laughs> who jumps over because there's dolphins in the water. You know, that's really stupid, but they do it. Uh, so uh, we don't have rattlings, but we have those mass tubes by Kathy that allow she me to get up mass high. tubes, I call them mass rails, same okay. thing. Yeah. yeah. So I, I, I just get up on the mass rails if I have to look far away. but. Rattlings are very good between your shrouds. Uh, lazy jacks and cradle covers. Uh, uh, this is actually on Gwen's boat, but we have a very similar system. You know, we had a traditional sail cover for a long time that we had to get you know, to kind of take off and take down below and put back on. Of course, you always want to put it on every day. I mean, you don't want you don't want to ever leave your sail at anchor, you know, uncovered because it's just terrible uh, damage on it. It's, it's a very important, expensive piece of equipment. So you always want to make it easy, easy, easy to cover it. So we, we have one, you'll see pictures of it similar. What it, it is is, is a, basically a sail cover that always stays in place. And ours over here at the top, when you, uh, you, it'll, it gives you an easy way to lower the sail too. Uh, it falls, when you lower the sail, it falls into the sail cover, and then uh, ours has a zipper at the top, we just zip it closed. So our sail cover is always there. Usually we have actually our sail cover on before we have our anchor down, because just as we're coming in, we just, after we lower the sail, we just immediately, well, immediately while we're uh, motoring that last little bit to the anchorage, we go ahead and put the sail cover on. So we never have an uncovered sail. And um, uh, really, uh, really like it. Here you show, here on this, on, uh, here uh, you can see it uh, as well. It attaches actually with some um, uh, some lazy jacks, which actually are lines that basically hold your sail as it comes down, uh, so that it, again, so that it goes falls nicely into your uh, into your cradle cover or uh, into your cradle cover and keeps it from spilling out. Um, um, Pam. Uh, uh, this is on your boat. You don't have that same kind of sail cover, but again, you have your lazy jacks here. You can show yours, and then there'll be some more pictures. Yeah, we, we just cover our sail with the mainsail covers, but we do, I, I, we do have lazy jacks on the boat. And the, the one thing that we, we wouldn't have one of those stack backs for is because we always put an awning up the minute we get in anchor it, you know, we're in the Bahamas or anywhere in the tropics, because the most dangerous thing that we encounter as sailors is the sun. sun. That's it, right there. So I have lazy jacks. ATN made them for me. ATN is the same one who does the, the shoot scoop and the, and, the, <clears throat> and the gale sail and, and many other wonderful things, the tacker for the spinnakers. He has but, a booth here. Yeah, he also has, he's got the mast climber that we showed you there that you can take yourself up the mast. Go see him, he made my lazy jacks so that with it, they all pull forward. They pull forward and I only, I only uh, deploy them. See, they're all pulled forward there. They're not in the way, and I can I can put my full awning up uh, and very simply. Our lazy jacks also uh, have a halyard have a halyard that comes down the mast, and we can release them too to bring them forward, so that we can then put an awning over it as well. So, um. so there, there's our mainsail cover. Here's a trick for a mainsail cover. <laughs> we have a conventional one. Don't make it go around the mast. <laughs> All you do is you cover up the winches that you might have to use sometime when you're working on a boat. And every time Andy would go and, and work on someone's boat where he had to get to the winches on the mast, it would take him 45 minutes to figure out how to un, unlace, you know, the, this um, sail cover that was on the mast. So ours has just got a, a just sewed a tunnel in the forward end of the conventional mainsail cover. 
put a great big piece of 516 bungee cord in it with a toggle on the end, and all I do is encapsulate the, the luff of the sail in it, and Bob's your uncle, and, the, and everything is already there for me to use without having to unlace uh, a mainsail cover from around the front of the mast. No necessary. It's not necessary. Another thing that's really nice in her picture is there's no zippers there, and zippers will go over time, and it's one thing you always have to replace on a sail cover. Uh, and uh, so you avoid having any zippers here, like here on the front of the mast, too, by doing that as well. By the way, see the car on the track? Wait, let's just go back. See the car on the bottom of the track there? The snorkel pole is up, or the whisker pole, oh, yeah, the downwind pole. There's the car that goes up and down. Okay. okay. Uh, yeah, here you can see our, uh, our uh, cradle cover here. And, uh, and 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 the ladies, lazy jacks rig, those will will release and go forward so that we can put an awning up then over that. So, stowing gear on deck. Uh, talk about it, several different issues of things of stowing gear on deck. Some of us, uh, uh, we actually this is actually Gwen Hamlin's boat, but we do this actually do the same thing. We do store our jerry jokes or some several jerry jokes along the rail. We have a wooden uh, board that uh, attaches to several of the lifelines and we tie them up along the rail. Underneath them we put some of that non-skid stuff. It actually gives the, gives the ability for the water to flow and it also keeps them from, from chafing around on deck. So we put some of the non-skid underneath it and we tie them along, alongside deck and it provides us with uh, extra, extra uh, diesel storage. Um, uh, here you can see the cloth, that the, the line as well, they're attached, oh yeah, here you can kind of see just using a little bit of, uh, of the non-skid stuff just to put underneath them to help the water flow and also just to avoid chafe there. May I, may I talk about this picture real quickly? Mm -hmm. See those jerry cans? What's happening to them? The sun is getting to them, okay? Uh, remember that the sun, the UV rays of the sun, whether it's in Florida or whether it's in Lake Superior, are going to start to deteriorate plastic. And you really should replace something that's got that color to it because it's, it's going to get so brittle that you could actually put your fingers through. And here's a little trick that, that we learned many, many years ago. Anything dark, like a black jerry can, will last 10 times longer than a white or a light colored or yellow jerry can. Now, I know in the United States of America, you have to have diesel in yellow and you have to have gasoline in red and you should have water in blue or white or something like that. But when you're out of the States or when you're on your own boat, if you can find a bunch of black jerry cans, they will last forever. And if you only use white, this is what's going to happen to them soon. Those are probably, those probably were yellow, weren't they? Uh, no, uh, yeah, if no. they were diesel, they probably were. Yeah. But I mean, you know, all, of, all I'm saying is that you should just keep track of this and, and make sure that you don't have a terrible disaster of puncturing them when they get to be that sort of chalky color, that's all. Um. Now we do it a little differently. We, we don't store anything on the rail, uh, just because Andy is a high latitude sailor and he knows what it's like if you have something go over the bow and take everything away uh, in high latitude sailing. So what we do is we, we try to keep everything inboard as close as we can. So if we took a big sea over the side, it wouldn't hit that and then maybe destroy it or take it, with, or, uh, you know, take it away. So you can see our extra jerry cans. Here we are about to cross the Atlantic. Uh, our extra jerry cans are all lashed again to those mast hoops that are so so handy for so many things, and um, everything is inboard. Okay. Um, there they are again. Okay. That's just another picture of the jerry cans inboard. Uh, uh, Gwen Hamlin, uh, who sometimes does this with us, is an avid diver, and uh, she says these are wonderful for storing dive tanks. To me, they look like that. You you know you think they slide out of them. She's done quite a bit of sailing. She sailed all the way to Australia, and she says no, actually they are very very secure. Excellent way to store dive tanks on board. These little holders here. Uh, in addition, here's how she stored her uh, kayak when she was kind of uh, 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 in port and just had it available there. Uh, I'm sure, she doesn't have it there under underway, but uh, uh, basically way to store their floating kayak. Um, Pam, this is your picture. Yeah. Because I'm tall, I have a big problem getting from the bottom of the dinghy up to the top of the deck. You're supposed to laugh. Are you not awake? <laughs> Come on, guys. Okay. So, yeah, thank you. Get it. Um, so, that's good. So, uh, we have this little mast step. Again, um, uh, this is very handy because we just put it on our perforated tow rail, or you could have put it on the stanchions that are at your gate. But it allows me to have another step. 
so that I can get into the boat easily from either a floating dock or from my dinghy. Uh, and he actually uses it in rigging to get even higher up a mast than he possibly can with a halyard sometimes too. I want I want to encourage you to do that. But it's 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 a really it's a lightweight little thing and it's a really sturdy stuff and it makes getting up and down the boat much much easier. Oh, and here's my water maker. <laughs> This is a high-tech, high-maintenance water maker, okay? <laughs> and we have used this around the world, and we do not have another water maker aboard the boat because this one takes so much maintenance. I, oh, wait! <laughs> All I do is I let it rain for a few minutes to get the salt water off the deck or get the deck clean. Just let it rain. And that cork is in the scupper in the deck there, that, that cork, cork right there. I take the tea towel from the galley, and I put it in my perforated tow well and just wrap it around uh, the deck fill. And I'd say in a downpour in the Bahamas, I could fill the deck and I can fill the tanks, the 35 gallon tanks in about 20 minutes. And um, we have never, ever, no matter where we've been in the world, ever been at a loss for water. Now, we conserve water. We don't shower and stuff like that, uh, except with seawater. But or if we're in port, of course, we, we use all the water we want. But this is a way of doing it, and the perforated tow rail still allows enough water to, to come down the deck in a downpour and fill up the tanks. And ladies, there's nothing better than washing your hair. Anyway, we have a little bit of time to talk about our solar panels. All of us, all of, all of us are big fans of solar power. In fact, you know, these days, um, uh, the solar panels are, are so wonderful. And, and actually, refrigeration, which many of us have aboard, has gotten so efficient that, you know, we basically just end up being pretty much uh, have our power generated by our solar panels and our wind generator. So what we're going to do is each show you kind of how we handle, how we do our solar panels. Uh, uh, on Halakai, we had 500 watts of solar panels. We had four on the stern arch, two on the cabin top, and then we had two on wing, wings, and we had a KISS wind generator. I'm going to show you the wings. Uh, so we had two, we had four on the arch and back. Uh, and then we bought these actually in St. Martin because we wanted some more power. So we bought these uh, two solar panels, and we rigged them. We had a, a welder there just bend us a piece of one-inch stainless pipe. And, we, and you can't see it very easy, too easily here, but then we have a one and a quarter inch pipe that it slides into. So basically we created a hinge that we could put these panels out here. And when we're in port, we basically just swing it out uh, and, and we can point those panels toward the sun. Uh, let's see, the next picture will kind of show you a little bit. We have those little sort of rail fittings there that allow us to pivot. Um, those panels forward and backwards. In the Caribbean, you're always basically facing east. And so, uh, you know, in the morning, we have them paint f uh, facing toward the east so we get the morning sun because it makes a big difference if the panels aren't oriented toward the sun. Uh, midday, they're facing straight up, and then in the afternoon, we would just tilt them back. So when we're in port, we just have them, have them out along the side, and then when we're underway, we just swing them back in. I think this next photo sort of shows it. It shows our little mass fittings underneath it better too, and then we just uh, tie them off. But they're always there, and it just gives us, you know, because we were really, it gives us a little bit of extra power. And so uh, it was a real nice way to add add uh, two more solar panels to our boat. Do you leave them there in heavy weather? Uh, yes, we have. They're really well attached, and we have for the kind of sailing we've done in the Caribbean. We've never had an issue with it. Mm -hmm. But they're well, they're very well tied down. So yeah. it alleviates anyone coming alongside. Oh, you, know, oh look, you look secure. I think I'll come alongside and tie up to you, mm -hmm. which happens in the Virgin Islands. Mm -hmm. uh, Gwen isn't here, but I'll just show, show you very briefly her panel. She kind of does a little similar thing, except she leaves her mounted. She actually swings them just out on the side. They, they attach to a rail there and swing out there. Oh, you can see a little bit more. She has a rail here. They swing out and then swing back down. Uh, and then Pam, these are yours, and this is going to be our last topic because I think we're about out of time. But we'll show you. You don't have to. Oh, I'm sorry. You should, yeah. Oh, yeah. Let me tell you that. Uh, you know, Kathy and I always joke that Kathy is the electronics wizard, and I'm this keep it simple, stupid, you know, kind of person. We we have aboard our boat. We don't have that much uh, electricity that we use. We have a deep freeze, a 12 volt deep freeze that I couldn't live without. We have our electronic equipment, and of course we have the Alpenglow lights, which are very efficient as far as their appetite. 
So we only have 100 watts of solar panels, but I want to tell you, they run everything. If you can switch the picture, we have a, a, what I call the mizzen. We put this post up, and those solar panels are just pipe on pipe, and they will articulate this way and this way. And, you know, solar panels are most efficient when they're perpendicular to the sun. So who's ever, you know, up on deck at the time when the sun is moving across the heavenly skies, it's their job to turn up. You can see right here in that picture, just before that picture, uh, where they're perfectly upright because they're getting the setting sun. So they're very, very efficient. We also have, of course, the wind generator, which we found terribly inefficient, especially sailing in the trade winds. If anybody's going downwind in the trade winds, <laughs> A big generator doesn't work because of your apparent wind. I mean, come on, give me a break. But we kept it for high latitude sailing because there's no sun up in Nova Scotia, right? So we have the wind generator for high latitudes, and we have the solar panels which keep everything, everything, our batteries all topped up 24-7. Uh, we love them. Yeah, so that just shows them and mm -hmm. brings in several different ways. So we've, we've run out of time, but we certainly haven't run out of ideas. You can always... Uh,